Because what we're looking for here is we want to see that after the money has been spent, after the money has been put into the checkbook and everything's been balanced and you've got it in QuickBooks or whatever system that you're using, we want to make sure that that was accurately done. All right. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, it is going to increase your donor confidence. And this is very important. Okay. There was a 2015 study done by the uh, Chronicle of Philanthropy. And it said that donor confidence had stalled. All right. We were at a point after the 2008 recession where donor confidence had gotten back up to its, its peak highs, but then it kind of stalled despite the fact that giving continued to go up. And as they looked into this, they said that the number one concern that donors had was that charities waste money. That there was not the accountability, there was not the transparency that the donor wanted in order to feel comfortable giving that charity money, all right? And that applies to the church as well. There's got to be some sort of transparency on how that money has been spent. Second thing is, is it provides some accountability. There's some integrity issues that come up when we have this examination process. Um, you know, one of the things that happens a lot of times, uh, in, especially in charity work, but also in uh, for-profit businesses, is you'll find people who will submit phony invoices to the organization from a phony company and they'll sign off on it and they'll have the person who writes the check write the check and then they'll take the check and put it in a bank account for a phony organization and guess what they've just stolen money all right and it happens all the time uh, from 2008 to 2012 the washington post did a survey of 990 forms that were filed with the irs they found over a thousand nonprofit organizations that were classified as having a significant diversion of assets and in order to qualify under that significant diversion of assets, it has to be more than $250,000 or 5% of your gross receipts for the year. All right. A thousand nonprofits. All right. Looking at those 990s, we can see, first of all, that there's going to be a problem in being able to carry that over to the church because churches don't file 990s, right? At least some of them don't. All right. So we've got to make sure that we have these accounting processes in place. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, the same study, the top 20 losses accounted for over $500 million. The top 20 of those 1,000, that's crazy. 20 organizations lost $500 million. And a 2014 study by the uh, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners found that 5% of all charitable donations in the country are lost to fraud. And 22% of all of those losses accumulated to over a million dollars. All right. So we've got to kind of think about this. You know, a lot of times when we talk about hiring a lawyer or hiring an accountant to, to help us walk through these situations and, and make sure our processes are in place to prevent this from happening, one of the chief objections is it costs money. All right. Well, we don't necessarily know how many churches are, are losing money because we don't necessarily file these 990s. Uh, but so we're in this situation where how much money would we actually save if we didn't skimp on those issues and didn't skimp on uh, legal and accounting? And what happens is, especially in the charity world, you, you, for donor confidence, donors want to see lean and mean organizations, right? They, they want to see that your church is running on a shoestring and that you're not wasting a whole bunch of money. And so what they do is they skimp on accounting. They don't hire an accountant. They skimp on financial staff. They skimp on legal staff or hiring an attorney. And what happens is it will go years where a low level employee, somebody who's a, a, a secretary or a custodian, will submit these phony invoices and it'll go year after year after year before somebody catches it. That's why those numbers get up there so high. And so when you think about the potential for loss there, how much money could we actually save if we didn't skimp on those areas? So there are a few different types of financial examination that I want to talk through, okay? And this is going to be on page 69 there. Um, the first one in the highest level is an audit, all right, where you hire an external firm, CPA, to come in and actually conduct an audit of your church's financials, all right? These can be expensive. Uh, expensive. If you want to save money, let me give you a piece of advice. Don't ask for this on March 15th because they're gonna charge you out the wazoo, all right? You wanna ask for this at some point where they're not busy, all right? An audit, they're gonna follow the generally accepted accounting practices and uh, generally accepted auditing standards. They're gonna go through all your financials and they want to provide a high level of confidence that your church's money was handled and stewarded appropriately, okay? 
again, that can be expensive. So if you can't afford it, let's try to maybe do that once every five years and just amortize it out over five years, take how much it's gonna cost, budget one fifth of that, and every five years try to do one of those, if not more frequently, okay? If you can't do an audit, then maybe you can ask for what's called a review. Again, this doesn't provide a, a full level or a high level of confidence that your church's finances were handled appropriately, but it does provide a moderate level uh, of, of certainty or assurance. Again, if you want to save money on this, don't ask for it on March 15th. Then the next level down is called a compilation, and really all this is is just a, a, a preparation of financial statements. This is not meant to help uh, the, the church or any donors have any degree of assurance or confidence that, that the church's money was handled appropriately. This is just, hey, let's get all of this financial data and put it into a, a digestible form uh, that we can look at. And same thing on this, this financial statement preparation. We launched a podcast uh, this, this month called Law and Church. You can find it on any of your podcasting apps. And uh, we've got an episode coming out here in the next few weeks uh, with a gentleman. His name is Donnie Baker. He's a loan officer and does a lot of loans for churches. Uh, and one of the things he talked about was, you know, when we get to where we're looking at these loan applications, the financials are usually just in shambles. You know, we typically ask for a financial statement and we get bank statements. And that's not what we're talking about. We want to see cash flows. We want to see the income statement. We want to see the, the balance sheet of the church. And so that means we've got to have inventories and so forth and so on. And so you know, being able to have those types of things on hand, ready to go, uh, is, a, is a great thing to do. The last thing you can do, again, if you have trouble affording uh, this external review, is you can do agreed upon procedures where you call the accountant and say, hey, here's what you want to do. Can you can you come in and do this for us and give us some degree of assurance that certain transactions were done appropriately, maybe big ticket items and so forth. Um, that's another way that you can do an external uh, examination. But you should also do internal examinations, all right? And internal examinations are typically done on a, on a volunteer basis and you can put together a committee that's got, uh, you know, they need to be active church members. Um, they need to be elected in a, in a business session, you know, follow your bylaws and do what you're supposed to there. They need to be completely independent from the decision makers of the church, so independent from the finance committee, independent of the senior pastor. They need to be independent. They need to obviously be people of integrity and have some degree of financial knowledge. They need to be given complete and unfettered access to all your church's financial records and then given a clear task assignment. Uh, and so go and audit these six months or go and audit any transaction over a certain amount or randomly pick uh, 50 different transactions and audit to make sure that we did those transactions appropriately. Um, if you don't have that level of a committee, uh, or you, know, you don't have enough people or you don't have people with financial acumen in your church, then you can ask another church to do it for you. And you can audit theirs and kind of just trade this as a volunteer, uh, on a volunteer basis. The two key things here are independence and openness in records, okay? The last thing you want to do, and when we see churches a lot of times in the news because something didn't go right in an investigation or an audit, they were not given independence. They were said, you're going to report to me what you find, and they were not given all of the data. They were saying, here's the data that you can base your decisions on. Uh, and in those situations, a lot of times what happens is uh, the people who were concerned about the financials or something that took place in the church get upset because there was no independence or no openness, and they get to go back and do it all over again. All right. So it's better just to do it right on the first time. Give everybody the openness uh, of those records and, and make them completely independent. There are a few things that you can do. This internal financial examination is a lot like an audit. You can do an internal control examination, which is basically a compliance audit where we're saying, here's what the policies are. Are those good? Okay. Now were the policies followed? Uh, and, and that's kind of the question that you're asking, uh, asking and answering there. And then finally, a property and equipment inventory. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. The last type of audit is the one that you don't want. It's the one that most frequently comes to mind when you hear the word audit. And that is an audit where the IRS calls you and says, hey, we're auditing your organization. Uh, you don't want that. Uh, if it does happen, get you an accountant, get your lawyer uh, on that case pretty quickly. Um, ultimately, they have basically unfettered access to anything, any record in your church uh, when that goes on. Uh, and so you wanna make sure you're in compliance make sure uh, you've got somebody because listen they're going to have accountants and lawyers on their side you're going to want somebody looking out for you on that okay